Let's talk about the biggest thing I think that modern medicine gets wrong. And what's given me this perspective is not just going through medical school and some of residency, but more importantly, being a patient with a chronic illness. And as many of you know, I've struggled with inflammatory bowel disease, also known as IBD, back since I was 18 as a freshman in college. Now, IBD is an autoimmune condition and the body essentially attacks itself in the gut. You have two types, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. In terms of my experience, pretty challenging. Luckily now I'm super well controlled, but that took years of work, right, to get to this point. And it very much inspired me to pursue medicine. Now, one of the things that always frustrated me though, ever since the beginning, ever since the, the very, the very, you know, the early diagnosis and when I was trying to get things under control is when I was told by physicians that diet based on the literature, based on the scientific evidence, doesn't have any effect on the disease. So you're telling me this foreign body, which is food that I ingest every single day has nothing to do with my disease that is a GI illness and therefore directly interacts, directly interacts with said external substance. So that didn't sit right with me ever since the beginning. And if you ask just about anyone that has IBD, they'll strongly disagree with this. I mean, you look at eight-year-old Kevin with Costco and Tabasco pizza. That was a happy Kevin. You look at 18-year-old Kevin with Costco pizza and Tabasco, he was dead. So the biggest thing that modern medicine gets wrong is not focusing enough on nutrition and gut health. And this is actually for everyone, not just for people with IBD. And here's why. Enter the gut microbiome. Now the gut is full of different microorganisms, including bacteria, viruses, fungi, and archaea. Growing up, you probably heard that germs are bad to be avoided, but these microorganisms actually, they serve important functions in our body. So they help us digest food that we can't digest ourselves. They help regulate our immune system. They protect against other bad microorganisms that can cause disease. And they also produce vitamins like vitamin B12 or vitamin K, which serve important functions throughout the body and that we can't produce ourselves. So when your gut and your gut microbiome isn't healthy, these important functions are negatively impacted. And this brings us to the enteric nervous system, which is a complex network of nerves and neurons and neurotransmitters all along the digestive tract, which communicate with the central nervous system or CNS. And since it uses the same types of neurons and neurotransmitters found in the CNS, and there's a lot of crosstalk between the gut and the brain, we sometimes call this enteric nervous system the second brain. For this reason, a lot of research is being done looking at gut health and even it's tied to mental health. There's a growing body of evidence showing that patients with mood disorders often show changes in their gut microbiome. In animal models, they've been able to transplant a healthy gut microbiome into a rat that demonstrates some depression-like behaviors. And then they reported significant improvements in those depression-like behaviors. And it works in the other direction too. So if you transplant the microbiome of a depressed rat into a healthy rat, then they will begin to develop those depression-like behaviors. Even preliminary research looking at fecal microbiome transplants in humans has shown strong evidence for both the treatment and transmission of psychiatric illnesses. But there are other reasons why diet and nutrition are important. So if we look at the leading cause of death in the United States, it's number one, heart disease, and number two, cancer. And both of these are actually heavily impacted by diet and lifestyle choices. I am certain that years from now, we're gonna look back on our processed food consumption and be like, oh my God, I can't believe how barbaric we were. It'll be like the new smoking where, you know, back in the 50s, people didn't think it was a huge deal. But nowadays it's like, mm, if you care about your health, you definitely shouldn't be smoking. Now there's no quick fix for improving your gut health. It's something that you need to continuously work at, not just with diet, which is very important, but also with prebiotics and probiotics. Prebiotics are foods that promote the growth of healthy bacteria in the gut. These are mainly foods with fiber and complex carbs that human cells can't digest, but healthy gut bacteria can. This is one of the reasons why having fiber in your diet is so important. It feeds the healthy bacteria. But you also need probiotics, which are the foods and supplements that contain live bacteria and yeast that are good for your gut. So now you know why the gut microbiome is so important and why there's been an explosion in research to learn more about this crucial component of our health. But what can you actually do about it? As they say, what gets measured gets managed. And if you want more objective insights into your own gut microbiome, then you need to test it. And that brings us to Ombre. Big thanks to Ombre for sponsoring this video. Ombre Lab makes it really easy to measure your gut health by offering an at-home test that can measure your bacteria levels, 
by testing your poop. The test will ship straight to your door with easy to follow collection instructions. And don't worry, it's all very sanitary. I did it myself in just a couple minutes without issue. Upon receiving your results, Ombre Lab will give you a detailed breakdown of your gut bacteria, the health issues it might be causing, and what specific foods you need to consume more or less of in order to improve your health. And based on the concentrations of the various species in my microbiome, it gave me personalized results as to what foods to consume more of and what to avoid. So they recommended that I consume more kiwi, more dragon fruit, and more legumes, and decrease my consumption of beef and eggs, as an example. I was also very excited to see them recommend I drink more green tea. And that's for the species of Acromantia, Bifidobacterium, and Bacteroides, Theta, Iota, Omicron, since I totally need another excuse to drink more loose leaf green tea. And if you wanna take it a step further, you can purchase a subscription and they will develop personalized probiotics based on your individual gut needs. So if you wanna start taking your gut microbiome more seriously, visit tryombre.com forward slash Kevin Jubal to get $30 off your test. All right, so if gut health is such a big deal, why don't we focus on diet and nutrition more in medicine? The issue is that in Western medicine, we over rely on research. We now have this thing called evidence-based medicine, which is usually a very good thing. And from a technical perspective, evidence-based medicine or EBM relies on three things. So number one, it integrates the experience of the clinician plus the values of the patient, and then the best available scientific information to guide decision-making. But the problem is that we tend to focus on just that last part, the scientific evidence. Before any kinds of treatments or interventions are recommended, there must be a strong body of evidence supporting their efficacy. You need to see several independent studies to either support or refute an idea. Even if preliminary studies show some promise, they show some effect, they aren't embraced by the medical community until it has demonstrated you know, stronger evidence, many different trials, multiple times, which makes sense. And while relying on the scientific literature is undoubtedly a great thing, we must not lose sight of the ultimate goal, which is to improve the health of our patients. All right, story time. So I was meeting with my gastroenterologist about a year ago. And when I told him that I take vitamin D supplementation as there is you know, some weak correlational research between vitamin D levels and maintaining remission with IBD, he scoffed. He said, the evidence is weak. You shouldn't take it. And I agree, the evidence is massively weak. It's also a question of chicken or the egg phenomenon. Is vitamin D actually the root cause and therefore lower vitamin D levels are associated with more flares? Or, and more likely, is it just a reflection of healthy people who are exercising, going outside and being active, and therefore they have higher vitamin D levels and they're just healthier all around. But that is massively missing the forest for the trees. Anytime you make a treatment decision, there's a risk. There is a risk to performing any intervention, which in this case is taking a low dose vitamin D supplement, just as there is a risk to not performing an intervention. In this case, that would be skipping vitamin D. Similarly, there is a risk profile to taking a vaccine, just as there is a risk profile to not taking a vaccine. There's a risk profile to undergoing surgery, just as there is a risk profile to not undergoing surgery, which is doing medical management. So I raised this point and I explained the asymmetric risk profile. There is a potential upside of helping me maintain remission with vitamin D supplementation and a very small, almost a negligible risk of taking vitamin D, assuming that I'm taking high quality supplements and at a reasonable dose. And ultimately he agreed, he gave me the green light to go ahead with vitamin D supplementation. But what I wanna highlight here is that just because there isn't strong evidence for doing something doesn't mean we shouldn't ever do it. It's tricky because as humans, we love black and white thinking and operating in that gray area requires much more nuance, but that's how the best decisions are made. Blindly just following a certain way of thinking without challenging it leads to problems. So going back to nutrition, it's even more important to use nuanced decision-making since the evidence around nutrition is quite poor in quality. Nutrition research has a lot of limitations. So first of all, there isn't much funding. Companies don't really have much to gain from doing research on nutrition. And much of the studies are surveys of participants and their dietary recall, which are prone to tremendous error. How many eggs have you eaten on average per week over the last five years? Heck if I know. And it's also really difficult to perform a randomized controlled trial with something like diet. Not only is it difficult to blind, depending on what you're testing, but diet is such an integral and deeply rooted part of our lives. It's difficult to just shift it arbitrarily based on a study for extended periods of time. And diet is one of those things that you need to maintain for extended periods of time in order for it to have any effect. There are also biases that are really difficult to control for. One of the biggest ones is the healthy user bias, where it's not the actual behavior or the thing that you're testing, but it's the fact that healthy people are more likely to do healthy behaviors. So for example, vegans tend to be healthier than non-vegans, but they also tend to be more health conscious in general. They might exercise more, they might sleep more, they might eat fewer calories, 
So it's not necessarily the fact that they're vegan that makes them healthy, but possibly these other confounding factors. On one hand, we're appreciating how important nutrition is. Many of the causes of death in the United States could be largely curtailed by improving diet. Things like cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and more. But our nutritional research sucks. What's worse is that people get so caught up in their identity around diet, almost as if it was a religion. I'm vegan. Can you give me this medal? Because I'm vegan. You don't appreciate the animals, pal. Shit, shit, shit. Come on, come on. The sign of sound judgment is being willing to change your mind based on new data. I was on a plant-based diet for over four years, but now I eat meat again. I don't take on an identity with a certain diet because the minute I take on that identity, I limit my ability to think clearly and it just introduces massive bias. Even though the research is no bueno, there are some things that we do know. Things like whole unprocessed foods are much healthier than highly processed foods. But when you start getting more into the details, a lot of the dietary decision-making needs to be highly individualized. We know that gluten, for example, increases gut permeability in everyone. And for some people that's a problem, and for others it's not. Many adults are lactose intolerant. So even when you're removing lactose and the enzyme lactase from the equation, some people tolerate dairy well, and some people don't. And I didn't. So I realized that the only noticeable improvement I had from switching to a plant-based diet was because I was limiting my dairy intake, but it might be different for someone else. Just because there isn't strong evidence for something doesn't mean that something isn't true. You have to be careful with that because many people will use that line of reasoning to justify dangerous or highly biased thinking. The good thing now is that more and more medical schools are incorporating greater amounts of nutrition into their curriculum. I was fortunate to go to a med school that did include greater than average nutrition instruction in the curriculum, but most medical schools only spend a couple hours if that. Now, another reason we don't prioritize diet and nutrition is that most Americans, they prefer quick fix. Changing your diet and lifestyle requires behavior change and behavior change is hard and it can take a long time to see results. People don't wanna hear about the solution that will fix the problem long-term. They want something that'll fix it now. And then you can see that theme across all of medicine. Oh, so you're having chronic back pain? Don't worry about losing weight or stretching or exercising. Here's some pain meds. Oh, so you're having insomnia. Never mind trying to improve your sleep hygiene or eat better or exercise or decrease your stress. Let's just do the sleep test and then prescribe you X, Y, and Z. Now, obviously this is a caricature and this isn't how medicine is actually practiced and definitely not how we are trained as physicians. If anything, it's more a response to cultural pressures and patient demands, but you get the idea. So the two main takeaways of this video is first, Evidence-based medicine doesn't mean doing only what is robustly supported by the scientific literature. It means incorporating the best of what we have in science, but still using intelligent decision-making and risk assessment when the scientific literature doesn't have a clear-cut answer. And second, despite that medicine doesn't put enough emphasis on diet and nutrition, it's one of the most fundamental pillars of our health. You may not see results immediately, but in the long term, your body and your mind will thank you. If you want to take the first steps to improve your gut health, then be sure to check out Ombre by visiting tryombre.com forward slash Kevin Jubal to get $30 off your test. Thanks for watching, guys. Much love, and I'll see you in that next one.